Good afternoon. My name is Connor Teske, and I'm the CEO of Brookfield Renewable. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for your interest and support of Brookfield Renewable Partners. Today, we'll spend our presentation talking about the stability and the growth of our business. In particular, we'll talk about how our business has expanded over the last 12 months, how our operations and approach to growth are well suited to the current environment, and in particular, how our elevated rate of growth over the last 12 months we believe is sustainable going forward. In particular, we'll also highlight options and levers we've added to our business that are going to allow us to dictate not only the pace, but the type of growth we pursue in the future to ensure that we can capture the most attractive opportunities. Jay and Natalie are gonna speak about our recent growth activities and strategies, and then why it will explain how all of that translates into our financials. When we were here last year at Investor Day, we reiterated this point that the tailwinds for our business were stronger than ever before. And today, we're very comfortable doubling down on that statement and saying we're in a better position today than we were 12 months ago. Brookfield Renewable is a leading global super major with over 100,000 megawatts of operating and development capacity. We have a global platform that spans five continents and every major renewable technology. Over the last 12 months, we've enhanced our strengths, and today we're more scaled, more diversified, and more differentiated than at any point in our history. But the way we've done that is incredibly consistent. On a global basis, we source, execute, and operate using our local teams boots on the ground in 20 countries around the world, which operate in close to 30 of the world's most important power markets. From there, we leverage our over 3,000 operating professionals to both enhance and de-risk our existing assets and our development activities. And then we leverage our 100 dedicated investment professionals to ensure that we're, we're seeing all the opportunities and allocating the, our capital to the most attractive ones. And as Wyatt will explain later in the presentation, we do this without ever getting away from the bedrock of our business, which is our balance sheet. Our uncompromising focus on our balance sheet ensures that we always have the liquidity available to pursue the largest and most attractive opportunities, regardless of market conditions. And today, we have the highest credit rating in the sector, a record level of liquidity, and no near-term maturities, positioning us very well for the growth runway we see ahead of us. And this approach has allowed us to increase our underlying cash flows at almost a 10% CAGR on a per unit basis over the last decade. And not only have we increased them, but over that time period we've strengthened and diversified those cash flows. And as we look forward in our business today, we are confident that we can not only continue, but also enhance that cash flow generation based on things that already exist within our business. Notably, development projects that are fully funded and about to come online, or revenue increases in contracts that either already exist or we've signed recently. This focus on underlying cash flows has allowed us to deliver high teens annual returns to our shareholders for over two decades, while at the same time continuously increasing our distribution on an annual basis within our five to nine percent target, a, rate that we, a target that we remain committed to even while funding an ever-growing growth opportunity. But as mentioned, Last year, we said the tailwinds were stronger than ever before, and we think we're in an even better position this year. And let's start with the macro. For years now, we have been saying that accelerating decarbonization trends and renewables position as the lowest cost form of electricity production 
are the major drivers that will drive growth in our sector. Last year, we added a third major driver, which is, for the first time in decades, we have highly visible increases in electricity demand coming over a sustained period going forward. This is driven by the electrification of large global industries, like industry and transport, that are going to electrify in order to decarbonize. That creates growing demand that renewables will support given its low cost position. And then lastly, now there is a fourth driver for our business that is perhaps the largest and most impactful today, which is over the last 12 months, energy security and energy independence has become a major priority for every government and region around the world. This is leading to the build out of domestic uh, energy generation capacity that is not reliant on imported foreign fuels. Today, corporations still are the largest driver of decarbonization. Within our own business and in the industry more broadly, we are seeing more demand for green power coming from new build renewable assets than there actually are available projects ready to be built. This has tipped the supply demand imbalance in favor of market participants such as ourselves who have both the pipeline and the operating capabilities to bring those projects online, on time and on budget to support that growing corporate demand. Further, corporations around the world are increasingly looking for partners to either help them decarbonize their own business or help them provide growing decarbonization solutions to the broader market. This again plays to Brookfield Renewable, who can use its size, global reach, and operating capabilities to be the partner of choice for corporations that either need an operating partner or a capital provider to reach their own decarbonization goals. But it's not just the corporates. Governments are increasingly throwing their support behind the build out of renewables and other decarbonization solutions. If you look at the slide, in every one of our major markets around the world, in just the last 12 months, a significant policy or support program has been announced to accelerate the build out of clean energy and decarbonization solutions and try and accelerate that transition to net zero. And what's important to remember from our perspective is while our industry will benefit significantly from these new policies and support programs, we did not take them into account in any of our underwritings. And therefore, they represent upside for our existing assets and our recent investments. Renewables continue to hold that position as the lowest cost source of bulk electricity production in every major market around the world, a position they've held for years now. And that is why renewables are going to be the sector that capture that growing electricity demand in the future. But perhaps what's more important over the last 12 months is renewables have proven not only to be the cheapest form of bulk electricity, but also the most stable. Because they are not subject to input costs that have become increasingly high and volatile over the last 12 months. And therefore, the economic benefits of renewables are stronger today than ever before. And then lastly, we get to the single biggest driver and the new driver, which is energy independence and energy security is a high priority for every major market around the world. And to put it very simply, renewables are the solution. In the Venn diagram of global objectives of net zero and low cost energy and energy security, renewables are the complementary shaded area in the middle because you don't need to import the sun and you don't need to import the wind. And that is why governments around the world are working as hard as possible to accelerate the build out of domestic generation. We've actually seen this happen before, not recently, but if you take yourselves back to the energy crisis of the 1970s, when people were concerned about a shortage of imported fuels and high and volatile energy prices, what did it lead to? 
it led to a sustained build-out of domestic generation that wasn't subject to foreign imports. At the time, that was a significant build-out of nuclear. We expect the exact same thing to happen today, except it won't be only nuclear, but also wind and solar, all areas where Brookfield Renewable is well-positioned to participate. But it's not only the macroeconomic trends that are stronger. Our business is incredibly stable and performs well in all market conditions. It's important to remind everyone that this is a real assets business that performs positively in an inflationary environment. As material and construction costs of new projects go up, these can be passed on to customers in the form of higher PPAs that are still at a significant discount to market energy prices. Further, within our existing business, the vast majority of our contracts are indexed to inflation, and our large and perpetual and scarce hydro portfolio is only increasing in value in the current market. And therefore, both the cash flows and value of our underlying businesses naturally increase during the current macroeconomic conditions. And this is because we offer a critical input to the global economy at the lowest cost. Because there is no input cost to renewables, green energy always sits at the top of the merit order. And that means we are not subject to short-term variability in electricity demand because everything we produce is consumed by the market. That's not going to change. Further, the production and consumption can be done at very, very stable profits because we are not subject to those volatile input costs that have dramatically changed the economics of thermal generation around the world. And what this means is despite the fact that we always talk about growth, our underlying business is performing very well and is backed by high quality cash flows. These are long-term contracts with high quality offtakes that are indexed to inflation. So even when markets are choppy and macroeconomics are a little bit uncertain, our cash flows remain stable and growing. And a point that was made earlier, in those situations where markets are a little bit uncertain, the benefits of our global operating expertise really shine through. When there are small market disruptions, we call on our local development teams, our centralized procurement teams, uh, and our large customer relationships to ensure that we can continuously, despite what is happening in the market, deliver our projects on time and on budget without ever disrupting our growth trend. This has been an increasingly large differentiator for our business over the last 12 months. So when you put that all together, 2022 has been the strongest year ever for our business. We expect to deliver record profits, continuing our trend of double-digit FFO growth. Secondly, it's been our largest year for capital deployment into growth ever. In fact, if you look at the slide, we've deployed more capital into growth in the last three years than our entire history up to 2019. And what's most important is we've done that without compromising on our 12 to 15% return targets that have existed for two decades. We've found those opportunities where we don't need to compete on cost of capital, and we can leverage our size and our operating expertise to enhance our returns and de-risk the investments we're making. But it's not just the scale of our investments. Not only have we deployed capital into our traditional asset classes, like operating hydro and wind and solar development, we've also made small initial investments into new growing decarbonization asset classes that we feel could be significant growth avenues for our business going forward. And lastly, our organic growth our in-house development has hit an inflection point in the last 12 months. In the last year, we've brought, over, brought online over 2,000 megawatts of new generation capacity that will deliver over $40 million of run rate FFO going forward. And this is really just getting started. Because for multiple years now, 
we have been investing highly accretive dollars into the ground at high teens to 20% development returns. And today, we have over 100,000 megawatts of development pipeline on a global basis. These represent very accretive growth options that we have at our disposal to pull forward when they provide attractive economics. And looking ahead, over the next three years, based on the returns we're seeing within that portfolio, we expect to bring almost 12 gigawatts of new capacity online over the next 36 months. So now looking ahead. Going forward, our strategy is going to remain completely the same. But there's one point of context we'd like to provide, which is last year, we suggested that our run rate deployment into growth would be somewhere between one and $1.2 billion per year on a run rate basis. And over the last 12 months, we've exceeded that level materially. And based on our pipeline today, we expect that level of growth to continue. And that is largely because we are seeing larger opportunities at very attractive risk-adjusted returns. And those opportunities largely fall in three different buckets. First is platforms. And what we mean by platforms is buying businesses that not only come with a very attractive portfolio of underlying assets, but also a capable management team that we can empower and support to find their own value and create their own growth. These represent very attractive upfront initial investments, but also future deployment opportunities as those management teams build out the existing development pipeline within those businesses. The second major type of investment is business transformations. What this is, is buying large power companies or supporting large power companies that need capital to transition to a more sustainable business model going forward. We view these as very attractive investments because we can also, also, sorry, we can usually enter at a very attractive value entry point and buy a cash generative business that we can deploy further capital in over time to rationalize the thermal capacity and, and replace that capacity with low carbon renewables. And we can put that incremental capital in at very attractive returns by using things like the interconnection and the offtakes that already exist within those businesses. And then lastly, as Natalie will speak to shortly, we are increasingly seeing new decarbonization asset classes that are growing very rapidly that could represent large and attractive growth avenues for our business going forward. So putting that all together, this year, as we have in the past, we are again increasing our expected deployment targets into growth, now expecting to deploy between six and seven plus billion dollars over the next five years. In conclusion and before handing to Jay, we believe our, our business is in a better position than ever to execute in the current environment. Our visibility to double digit cash flows is more certain than it's ever been in the past. And we believe that we are well positioned to maintain the elevated rate of growth that we've seen over the last 12 months. With that, I'll hand over to Jay. Hi, everyone. So my name is Jahangir, and I'm the chief investment officer of our renewable power business. We believe that growth in renewables is going to be tremendous over the next few decades. If this presents a very considerable investment opportunity and an area where we can deploy significant capital for the foreseeable future. The primary reason for this is clean energy is the first critical step in the transition to net zero. Over time, as more decarbonization opportunities scale, we expect transition investments to grow within our portfolio. But investment in clean power generation remains the largest decarbonization investment opportunity today. We therefore expect it to re represent the majority of our deployment for the foreseeable future. We see some incredibly strong tailwinds propelling the industry. 
Connor discussed these in detail, but they include corporate demand for green power is growing significantly as businesses increasingly adopt carbon reduction targets. Government support continues to be strong. For example, recently the Inflation Reduction Act was passed in the US, which significantly benefits renewable production. And today, renewables are the cheapest form of electricity production in many areas around the world. This is important because buyers of renewable power are primarily driven by economics instead of just green attributes. And lastly, as, as mentioned before, renewable assets provide governments with energy security, which is critical in the current environment. The market needs far more renewables, meaning renewables are in the very early stages of their growth trajectory. We expect the next decade is going to see tremendous growth with capacity additions of over, ten, over 1,000 gigawatts. This is over 4x the current deployment. And this will only increase over the next 30 years to achieve net zero. As storage further develops, renewables could be as much as 90% of the grid from 30% today. This is a very meaningful step change. Today, demand for power is growing for the first time in 30 years. And we think this is only going to accelerate due to electrification, which will be key to decarbonizing businesses. Over the next few decades, we believe many production processes will be replaced with electrification. We expect to see this in the CNI segment, which is the commercial industrial segment, the residential segment, and of course the transportation, the quickly growing transportation segment. And this takes place through technologies like electric cars and buses, heat pumps in buildings, and electric furnaces for steel. Renewables, given their low cost position and zero carbon emission profile, are very well positioned for that growth. Renewable power portfolios are getting to greater scale, and developers and off-takers are keen to work with strong, reliable partners that have the global presence and deep operating capabilities, as we do. Investing in renewables is competitive, but we remain very differentiated in our approach. We focus on large-scale transactions where we can leverage our operating platform and our strategic advantages. We believe our track record, ex expertise in complex development, and strong relationships with customers allows us to be the counterparty for choice for renewables investments. Our global renewable power platform is what gives us this leadership position. Today, we manage a highly diversified portfolio of renewable assets across four continents and five technologies. Our presence in all major power markets globally ensures that we see all potential growth opportunities. We have significant platforms in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. And this allows us to make acquisitions of scale in these regions. And now we've also executed sizable transactions across all major renewable sectors in the last 12 months. Examples of these we'll talk about in some more details. Our greatest value is our multifaceted platform that operates across all major markets. We have 3,000 operating professionals around the world who help, help us execute on a broad range of opportunities. Our platform includes strong equipment procurement, PPA origination, and power marking capabilities, which significantly differentiates us and allows us to maximize value for investments. This means that we not only buy renewables, but can develop, build, and operate them, which gives us a very meaningful advantage in the market. Given our position as a partner of choice, we've established a diverse customer base with approximately 800 different customers across all types of off-takers, multiple global regions, and all major renewable technologies. Our global reach, scale, and various platforms allow us to generate consistent growth and be a reliable counterparty for renewable projects. When we think about underwriting deals, we can create a lot of additional value through our commercial expertise. In this current environment, counterparties often give us preferable terms because they value certainty of build and reliability. As a result, we're able to create strategic partnerships with some of the preeminent buyers of renewable energy. Some examples. With Amazon, we entered into a strategic collaboration agreement to develop renewable projects underpinned by PPAs from them. And with BASF, a multinational chemical company, we signed a 25-year fixed-price renew renewable energy supply agreement to power one of its large and largest production facilities that it's building in China. Now, we want to highlight how we have put all these capabilities into practice, 
and leveraged our strengths to secure attractive investments and enhance operational value. As you can see, we've been able to significantly accelerate and enhance our development pipeline across regions and technology type. Our development pipeline currently stands at approximately 100 gigawatts, which is over three times the size it was when we stood here last year. This pipeline includes many high quality, high returning projects that are valuable options for us to develop. We've also made a number of transactions exemplifying the strategy, and in particular, we've done so recently in the United States. We've bought three large renewable development platforms, one across each of utility scale solar, distributed generation, and wind. This is 1.5 gigawatts of operating assets, nearly 50 gigawatts of development pipeline, and nearly 3 billion of total investment, and it's expected to deliver 2 gigawatts of annual development on a runway basis. Urban Grid has significant transmission capacity in the highly constrained and valuable PJM market. Since buying the platform, we've been able to contract one gigawatt of projects with very strong PPA pricing. We also recently closed on the acquisition of Standard Solar. Standard Solar is a leader in distributed generation with close to 500 megawatts of operating and under construction assets and an exceptionally strong development pipeline and platform. And lastly, today, we announced the acquisition of Scout Clean Energy, which is primarily focused on wind development, but also has quite a strong operating asset base and a very strong development team. All of these investments have a similar theme. They leverage Brookfield's value levers, and most importantly, are independent businesses that will find their own future growth and add their own value. We also think the timing of these investments is incredibly important. We underwrote these investments to attractive returns, but all three platforms will meaningfully benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act which provides further upside to our investments. We are fortunate with these recent acquisitions. We are uniquely positioned to benefit from the act, making our growth prospects in the US very significant. And overall, we expect these businesses and our platform to be well-placed as renewable economics stranded and the opportunity set grows. To put it all together, we intend to continue to scale and grow our renewable investments globally. The next decade excites us, and we think it's going to be a very exciting time for the renewable business as the technology continues to evolve, economics continue to strengthen, and we see the opportunity set growing very substantially in front of us. Our scale and platform allows us to create multiple levels for FFO growth and value creation. Thank you. Natalie will be up next. Thanks, Jay. As Jay and Connor have, all, have both already mentioned, renewables has, has always been and will always remain the backbone of our business. But for more than five years now, we've been diversifying our asset base, both into the new technology classes and renewables that you just heard Jay speak about, but also into new high growth areas and asset classes like in the energy transition. Today, this segment of our business represents over 10% of our AUM. And as the need for decarbonization enabling infrastructure grows, the need for capital and therefore the potential investment universe also grows. As this universe grows, we expect that this segment, uh, uh, this segment as a percentage of bets over our overall portfolio will also continue to expand. Now, Having a decarbonization strategy in today's landscape no longer seems novel, but because this is something that we have been meaningfully, uh, we have been building towards for over five years, we benefit from having the largest transition franchise in the market today and the unrivaled first mover advantage that comes with that. Now, it starts, of course, with our renewable platform. Our global and diversified presence in renewable energy already gives us a clear leadership position. And now that we have BGTF, our $15 billion global transition fund, which today is the largest, fund the largest global fund focused exclusively on decarbonization, we also have that leadership position. This allows us to capitalize on the ample opportunities that we're seeing in this space and continue to expand our portfolio into those newer asset classes like storage, 
hydrogen, biofuels, and recycling. And the reason we're so well positioned to be successful is because we possess those four key attributes that you heard Connor speak about earlier in his presentation. We have global reach, large scale and flexible capital, operating and clean energy expertise, and investment expertise. We've got presence in over 20 countries, and we've built a deep team of over 3,000 operating professionals, over 100 investment professionals, and a growing team of ESG and impact specialists to support on executing those decarbonization plans. And of course, to support all of this, we have scale and flexible access to capital, both through our public and our private vehicles, and all supported by a strong balance sheet and strong lending relationships. Our investment strategy in transition will be no different to what we apply in our renewable energy investments. We will stay laser focused on high quality assets and proven technologies, and we will, which have strong cash flow visibility and downside protection, where we can exercise significant control and influence to generate value and grow those investments over time. As we do this, we will be able to deliver on real decarbonization benefits with no discount for financial returns. Because in decarbonization, value creation and ESG impact is indeed complementary. So how exactly are we putting this into practice and unlocking these opportunities in the energy transition? Well, it's simple. We leverage those long-standing corporate relationships that we've built across the Brookfield franchise to engage with corporates who are interested in decarbonizing their businesses. And then we lead with our advantage in renewable energy. Because every decarbonization plan starts with clean energy. Our first conversation with corporates is always around how we can leverage that PPA expertise that Jay just spoke about to offer those bespoke clean energy solutions to help address their scope two emissions. Once we've established that relationship, we're then able to engage with them to understand their other changing energy needs as they're implementing solutions to reduce their scope one emissions as well. Right now, we're having conversations with corporates who are looking to electrify uh, their current processes or to implement low carbon alternative fuels into their existing processes, or install carbon capture equipment onto their existing machinery. Once we understand what those plans are, we can offer to either help fund those investments or to introduce them to our portfolio companies who possess the knowledge and expertise in those asset classes, and then we invest our capital into those, those solutions through those platforms. The result, we have attractive and bilateral opportunity sets with the ability to generate both strong returns and true additional decarbonization impact. And it's as we've grown this portfolio of transition asset classes that we have continued to establish ourselves as a one-stop shop for decarbonization solutions and really to cement our position as a trusted and preferred, preferred partner for corporates who are looking to decarbonize. Our investment strategy will take us where the emissions are. We want to invest in and alongside some of the economy's hardest to abate but critical sectors like power, industrials, transport, and energy. This could be through us buying a utility and then helping them to reduce their thermal emissions as we build out renewable energy production, or we could partner with businesses across all sectors, directly investing into their major emission reduction projects, which help them meet their own net zero goals. And in addition to helping to transform these heavy emissions business, businesses, we're also dedicating capital to scale the proven and low carbon products and solutions that they will require in order to meet their net zero plans. This includes through investments into assets, asset classes like carbon capture, hydrogen, renewable fuels, and recycling solutions. And all of this will give BEP an enhanced opportunity set 
through which to continue to deliver on the historic growth that you've seen us deliver for the past five years. The opportunity set as we expand our portfolio into these areas is large. By 2030, annual investment into low carbon solutions will need to reach $4 trillion of capital to scale these asset classes. Let me repeat that. That's $4 trillion annually. This will require creative funding solutions and significant capital to scale these asset classes as the technologies prove out and CapEx costs come down. In BGTF, we're already positioning ourselves to do exactly that through acquiring options which will enable us to deploy significant capital as the preferred scaling partner of choice across a range of technologies as these assets develop over the coming years. We've already made a number of small initial investments totaling around $100 million. And while these initial investments are small, they're downside protected. And in exchange, we will get preferred rights to invest up to $5 billion of follow-on equity as those businesses develop and as projects are brought, brought forward. This strategy has a number of appealing benefits to us. First, all of these opportunities give us discretion over deployment of follow-on equity on a project-by-project -project basis. This means that we'll be able to allocate our capital to the best sectors and the best technologies as these asset classes scale over time. Second, it gives us access to additional sourcing channels via our own partners and their business development efforts. This allows us to keep our investment teams lean and focused on identifying new large growth opportunities for our business over time. And third, it allows us to have real impact in aiding the transition by bringing our contracting knowledge and our project financing expertise to help turn these technologies into the core stabilized infrastructure asset classes of the future. I wanna to finish today by briefly spotlighting how we're applying that strategy that I just talked about into the carbon capture space. This is a space where we've already made two investments, each focused in two of the most attractive jurisdictions for carbon capture today, Canada and California. These investments, uh, the first one being our partnership with CRC and the second one being our investment into Entropy, are both structured in a way, in such a way that gives Brookfield strong downside protection, either via um, minimum equity returns at conversion or put rights. Furthermore, we have full discretion over future capital spend into follow-on projects. If those pipelines develop as planned, it will result in, uh, it will result in up to two billion of equity deployment opportunities over the fund life and bring online over eight million tons of annual carbon capture capacity by 2030. In fact, we've already commissioned our first commercial scale carbon capture asset in Alberta, Canada through our entropy investment, one which we expect will be the first of many. I'll end here for today, but I hope I've left you with the same feeling of excitement that we have about the scale of the opportunity and transition, and in particular, the substantial growth opportunity that this will have on BEPS portfolio over time. But of course, no growth is possible without a strong balance sheet. So with that, I'll bring up our last speaker for renewables, Wyatt, to talk about our financials. Thank you, Natalie. <clears throat> Excuse me, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Wyatt Hartley, and I'm the Chief Financial Officer of the Renewable Group here at Brookfield. And today, what I want to talk about is why, in the environment that Connor, Jay, and Natalie described, where the transition to net zero <clears throat> is creating what could be the greatest commercial opportunity of our time, and where access to capital is becoming more challenging, why we believe more than ever that BEP is a must-own renewable stock. Last year, we highlighted three things that drive this. First, we have unique growth capabilities. 
making us one of the few businesses with the scale, with the strategy, and the capabilities to execute on the growing, increasing number of growth opportunities in the sector. Second, we have one of the strongest balance sheets in the sector and a differentiated funding model. And finally, as Connor mentioned, our cash flow growth is increasingly secure, generating almost 10% FFO per unit growth through organic initiatives alone, and a strong likelihood of outperforming to the extent we benefit from additional M&A or development activities. So our current message today is that in the current environment, our business is even, even further differentiated by these factors, and it's for the following reasons. Starting with the strength of our balance sheet and our access to deep and varied sources of liquidity, which has become even more valuable in an increasingly volatile capital market. Of course, underpinning all of this is the strength of our financial position. Most importantly, we have a strong, triple B positive investment grade balance sheet. This means that all the way through our capital structure, our debt is either investment grade or structured to investment grade characteristics. In addition, 90% of our borrowings are project level, non-recourse, fixed rate, long duration debt, which translates well on a maturity basis with an average remaining term of 13 years, and as importantly, no material maturities over the next five years. And our liquidity is as strong as ever, with four billion available, providing significant financial flexibility to take advantages of periods of capital scarcity. Furthermore, with the recent closing of Brookfield's $15 billion global transition fund, as well as our participation in Brookfield's infrastructure funds, we have access up to scale capital to invest alongside of us, which is increasingly beneficial in these markets. And as I mentioned, we also maintain access to flexible and diverse sources of capital to fund the growth of our business. As an example, looking back over the last five years, we funded the entirety of the $6 billion of equity capital we invested into growth without having to access the equity markets apart from our strategic share-for-share -share privatization of Terraform Power. When we finance our business, our focus is to prudently source our lowest cost of capital. This means we maximize corporate debt, preferred equity, and unutilized debt capacity across our existing assets, but all while maintaining strong investment grade ratings. Furthermore, we will continue to execute on our program of asset recycling, of selling mature, de-risked, non-core assets to lower cost of capital buyers, where demand for operating de-risk renewable projects remains strong even in the current environment, and then re redeploying those proceeds into higher yielding opportunities. As I mentioned, we're accessing additional debt capacity across our existing business on an investment grade basis. As an example, earlier this year, we signed a 40-year power purchase agreement at our Liev Hydro facility with Hydro-Quebec. The contract was done at premium to, uh, prices that are premium to the, the prices the facility had historically achieved, generating $20 million of additional revenue but more importantly for us, given the duration of the contract and the quality of the counterparty, we raised an additional almost billion dollars of 40-year fixed rate investment rate debt. And we substantially redeployed that capital into growth at our target returns, which is expected to generate over $100 million of annual net FFO for our business. Said differently, through the recontracting and upfinancing of this one hydro, we funded the majority of our equity deployment this year at very attractive rates. Furthermore, with approximately 5,500 gigawatt hours of generation available for recontracting across our portfolio over the next five years, and an increasingly constructive pricing environment for hydros, 
we have significant capacity to execute on similar contracts that we expect to contribute additional FFO, as well as generating a highly accretive funding source for our growth. All of this means that we have a differentiated cost of capital. This comes from our ability to access additional investment grade debt capacity across our hydros, as I just mentioned. It comes from executing on our capital recycling program. But it also comes from the fact that we maintain our strong investment grade rating, meaning our corporate financings are not reliant on the high yield markets, which have seen a meaningful cost increase. As well as the fact that we are not relying on equity issuances, except to the extent we do large strategic transactions. All of which translates to a very meaningful cost of cap capital advantage for our business. And when, when we are putting this capital to work at target equity returns of 12 to 15 percent, the benefit of building long-term value to our shareholders is very meaningful. Moving next to the quality of our cash flows, and I covered this uh, a little bit last year, but to quickly remind everyone, we believe we generate the highest quality cash flows in the sector. This comes from our largely perpetual and dispatchable asset base, our highly contracted profile that has an average duration of 14 years, with 70% of our revenues indexed to inflation, as well as our high margins, given we have little to no input costs, meaning our cash flows benefit in an inflationary environment. And finally, we have very little exposure to floating rate debt. And as we have grown the business, we have also significantly de-risked our cash flows by increasing the diversity of our, of our portfolio. Our current business is diversified across multiple markets and technologies such that no single market represents more than 10% of our business. Furthermore, as Jay mentioned, we continue to be focused on maintaining a high quality customer base with over 800 investment grade customers under long-term contract, meaning our largest non-government non third-party customer represents less than 3% of our generation. And finally, as a result, we have no material foreign exchange exposures. And as a result of all this, we are well positioned to continue to deliver on our decade-long track record of annual FFO per unit growth of greater than 10%. As we have highlighted previously, we have multiple levers to drive our cash flow growth, both organic and M&A. And as Connor mentioned, in the current environment, we are seeing meaningful tailwinds for each of our growth levers, meaning the cash flow growth of our business is increasingly secure. And while we believe there is a strong likelihood of outperforming to the extent we benefit from additional M&A and development activities, we have effectively secured a large share of our target FFO per unit growth over the next five years without the need for additional capital. And this comes from three basic building blocks. The first is inflation which given, as I said earlier, that almost 70% of our revenues are indexed to inflation, and given we gener generate at high margins, and we use almost exclusively fixed rate debt, our cash flows benefit from an inflationary environment. And therefore, we expect to generate a minimum 2% annual FFO per unit growth over the next five years, with material upside if we are in a period of prolonged higher inflation. And from a margin enhancement perspective, we're also well positioned to benefit from increased demand for baseload carbon-free generation. The way to think about this is that over the next five years, and I mentioned this earlier, we have approximately 5,500 gigawatt hours of generation that is rolling off contracts. And if we were to recontract this generation at current all-in market prices on a forward basis, which includes the grid stabilizing services and renewable energy credits that we sell from our dispatchable hydros, the net impact to our cash flows will be positive, generating over $130 million of annual FFO, or 3% annual FFO per unit growth over the next five years. And finally, I think this is probably the piece that is most underappreciated about our business, 
is how the development dollars we have in the ground or projects that are in an advanced stage of development, meaning they are substantially de-risked and funded, will translate to FFO in the next few years. Looking at the detail, we have close to 6,000 megawatts of projects where our development dollars are substantially in the ground and are expected to deliver $80 million of annual FFO when commissioned. Further, we have an additional over 6,000 megawatts of advanced stage development projects that have been materially de-risked and for which we have secured substantially all the required funding. These projects are expected to generate $85 million of annual FFO when commissioned, meaning between these two buckets alone, we have substantially de-risked 3% annual FFO per unit growth over the next five years. And as Jay and Connor touched on, our development activities are increasing, and we now have an additional almost 90,000 megawatts of potential development projects that are well diversified across regions and technologies that provide a significant runway for growth that we can pursue, provided the market environment supports it, which we are confident that it will. So bringing this all together, looking over the next five years, we have effectively secured almost 10% FFO per unit growth. And with the additional tailwinds in our business, we are highly confident that all roads lead to growth at our most historic rate. So with that, I'll turn it back to Connor for concluding remarks in Q&A. Great. So quickly in conclusion, and at risk of reading the slide, there's four or five takeaways we'd like to leave everyone with. First and foremost, the tailwinds for our business continue to accelerate and are now stronger today than ever before. And the current environment plays very well to the strengths that are inherent and unique to our business. This leads us to have a highly visible path to cash flow increases in the coming years. And based on our growth pipeline, both organic and M&A, we expect our recent elevated pace of growth to continue in the near term. And lastly, we do all of this without ever compromising on our 12 to 15% return targets and without ever compromising on the attractive risk-adjusted returns we seek for our capital. With that, We'd like to thank everyone for watching today's presentation, and we'd welcome any questions from the audience. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, Andrew Kusky, Credit Suisse. Connor, if you look out five or 10 years, how do you think about the composition of, of Brookfield Renewable? And, I, and it weaves into a little bit of Bruce's comments earlier on with Mark. You know, there was a point that wind was an economic you really had no exposure. Solar was an economic. You really had no exposure. Now you've got meaningful exposure in both those verticals. So how do you think about CCS, hydrogen, and then what does that mean for the face of Brookfield Renewable as it is now? Absolutely. Great question. Without question, the majority of the dollars we are still putting to work today are in the core asset classes that we've been investing in for decades. Hydro, wind, solar. So to your question, looking out 10 years, those are going to continue to be the dominant asset classes in our portfolio. But absolutely reinforcing what Natalie said, the energy transition and decarbonization solutions component, while it might be just shy of 10% today, we do expect that to grow, but renewables are still going to be the dominant uh, majority. Uh, I would expect at least 70, 75% plus for the short to medium term. Okay, that's helpful. Then just maybe as a follow-up, do you have an incubation strategy for certain businesses? Like CCS is a good example where potential is large, very large, but it's really in the early stages of things. When, when do you step in, really early stage, grow it, and then spin it off? Or do you stick for around for the longer term? Certainly. So we, we approach CCS the exact same way we approach wind and solar five or 10 years ago. We are investing in these asset classes 
because we expect them to grow materially over the coming decade. And while we may sell individual assets within, let's say, our, our carbon capture portfolio, we expect to be a consistent and major player in that space and always will retain the platform from which we can either buy assets or develop assets in-house. So the same way we've treated wind and solar, we may recycle individual assets, but these asset classes that we've entered, we expect to maintain our exposure to in perpetuity. Hi, it's uh, Ben Pham, BMO Capital Markets. Uh, I'm listening to the comments, Connor, and a very robust outlook. Development black backlogs tripled since last year. You have energy transition. So when you think about the energy or the equity deployment targets, I would have thought it's been a much bigger bump. You know, 1.5, maybe 2 is a bit of a stretch. Green sky scenarios. Are you maybe excluding M&A in that outlook. I'm just a little bit underwhelmed by how much the targets have gone up, just listening to all the commentary. Fair enough, so I would reference two things. One, last year our target was a little bit lower, one to 1.2, and we've deployed about two uh, in the last 12 months. And based on our near-term pipeline, both organic and inorganic, uh, we expect that elevated rate of deployment to continue in the near term. But really what drives whether or not it's going to be at 2 or 1.5 are some of the larger scale deals that we are increasingly seeing. And if we do more of those, we're going to be above our targets, there's no question. But those are large and chunky transactions, and they don't always come to fruition. There are certainly a couple in our pipeline today that if we do execute, will push us above our run rate. Understood. Uh, thank you. And then follow up the the cost, 6% in the last couple of years, is it more friction to that, 6.5%, 7% now with rising interest rates? Certainly. So there's a really interesting dynamic going on in the financial markets right now, which is um, there continues to be very, very robust liquidity and deep access to lending markets for renewables and infrastructure and high-quality assets. So while underlying rates have increased substantially, we're actually seeing spreads hold constant. And therefore, we haven't seen rates move too much for our project level financings. So while if interest rates continue to rise, those numbers might creep up, creep up a little bit, we don't expect them to have a material impact on, on our broader financing strategy. Thank you. Uh, Rob Hope, Scotiabank. Uh, just to follow up on Ben's question there, you mentioned that you're seeing you know, a number of large opportunities in the pipeline. You know, if we look back over the last 12 months, you've been very successful in a number of acquisitions, but we'll call them not necessarily operating assets. they will be you know, a little bit of operating, but a large development backlog there. So when you look forward, and just given the scale of capital that's chasing all these opportunities, do you need that development kicker to compete, or do you need you know, some other form of differentiation to... Uh, you know, set your returns apart from your peers. So if we were to look at our deployment over the last 12 months, um, what's interesting is we exercise the came, same capital discipline in, in all market environments. And if you go back to last year, we put a lot of pucks on net and, and didn't score as many goals as we would have liked. And I think that's because markets were very, very frothy Everyone had unlimited access to capital, and there was a, an absolute gold rush of money into renewables. Now you fast forward to this year, and using the exact same capital discipline and approach to underwriting, we're having a much higher shooting percentage. And the fact that things, that, that a number of the transactions we've done this year are development, that's purely opportunistic. Especially in the current market environment, I think our access to capital significantly differentiates us. And we could see many opportunities to buy operating assets at attractive returns in the next 12 months. Mark Jarvie from CIBC. So, Connor, you mentioned that um, you know, the shooting percentage has gone up because competition for assets is maybe moderated a little bit. 
We flip that around, how does that look for then asset sales? Looks like that as the funding mix has come down a little bit. And then maybe you can expand on the, um, the, the strategic privatization and, and, and how you came up with that number in the funding mix and whether or not privates are open to that as well as just public companies. Definitely. Um, so when it comes to, to capital recycling, it's important to, to recognize what we do in our business. We buy businesses that we think we can de-risk better than anyone else. And, and that's how we can buy for value at attractive returns and then through our operating plans, simplify those businesses such that they can be sold to someone with a lower cost of capital. And that, that margin compression between where we buy and where we can sell our mature businesses that are at the end of our business plan is still very, very significant. And we're not really seeing too much uh, compression of that margin and therefore capital recycling is still very attractive and a big part of our, our funding plans going forward. Secondly, to your question around using our equity as a uh, currency for a potential large transaction, we will consider it, but only when it's highly accretive and strategic to our business. We did it most recently with the privatization of TERP if we saw another transaction that was both that accretive and that beneficial to the growth of our platform, we would absolutely consider it. I think we are running out of time here. Maybe one last question very quickly. Thank you, Ben Butler, Veritas Investment Research. Um, you guys are forecasting um, power prices in North America to be $77 per megawatt hour over the next decade. I'm just curious how this compares to your more recent uh, PPA with 40-year uh, PPA with Hydro uh, Quebec that you recently signed. Certainly. So power prices have gone up significantly, and there's certainly a difference between when you contract a 40-year PPA versus what power prices are going to be in the short term, which are much more driven by things like near-term gas prices. Uh, what we would say is we are coming out of an extended period of very low power prices to ones that are much more constructive for our business over the long term. And we will take advantage of that. As Wyatt mentioned, we have a significant amount of uncontracted capacity. We are continuously locking that in, which means not only are we going to reap the benefits of those higher power prices this year, we're locking in those higher power prices for the short to medium term. So we'll, we'll enjoy those benefits for several years to come. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate everyone's time.